I'm Bob Denton and welcome to another conversation. You know, for the past couple of years, there's been a lot of discussion about our elections in terms of voting access, integrity, and the voting process itself. There seems to be growing interest in ranked choice voting, which we are seeing as an option in some Virginia localities. We're joining me in the conversation to better understand what it is in terms of ranked choice voting, its advantages and disadvantages, is Dr. Nicholas Goddard, Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science at Virginia Tech whose area of expertise is elections. And thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I appreciate you being here very much because I myself am not fully convinced yet about ranked uh, uh, choice voting. But before we get into some of the aspects of it, you're on the board of uh, Upvote Virginia. Tell me about that uh, initiative. Sure. So Upvote Virginia is a new group which has sprung out of uh, one Virginia 2021, which had advocated for redistricting reform, I would say successfully, um, and we have transitioned to advocating for ranked choice voting, particularly in Virginia, um, and especially in local elections and primary elections. Well, so let's start with just, and we'll get into some of the nuances, but start by giving us a, an idea um, of how you would define Ranked choice voting. Sure. So ranked choice voting is essentially a variation on the voting system that we're all familiar with that's used in the vast majority of American elections that we might call plurality rule voting. Under plurality rule voting, you're electing candidates to a single office or a seat in the legislature. Voters see all of the candidates listed on the ballot and they vote for a single candidate. And then the candidate that gets the most votes wins the seat. Now, this is the candidate that wins the most votes, regardless of how many votes that is. It could be 80%, could be 50%, could be 20% in a large field. Um, the difference with ranked choice voting is the first stage of voting is exactly the same, right? Every, every voter votes for a first choice candidate. However, each voter also has the opportunity to vote for a second choice candidate or a third choice candidate. In the initial tabulation, you just count the first place votes. And if one candidate has a majority of the vote, so more than 50% of the vote, they win the seat. However, if no candidate has a majority, then you eliminate the bottom candidate and the votes for that candidate are reallocated to their voters' second place choices. Um, you then retabulate the votes, and if someone has more than 50%, they win. If they don't, you eliminate the next candidate. And you continue to do this until one candidate has at least 50% of the vote. Ultimately, it might get down to the top two candidates, in which case ranked choice voting is almost very similar to a runoff, um, in which one candidate will, of course, get at least 50% of the vote. Um, is this um, better for... Uh, from your perspective, I guess you would support this for any and all elect primaries, uh, uh, regular elections, gubernatorial, statewide, presidential. In other words, you think this is a system that's not just with, for primaries or mayors or local elections. Certainly, I think it's a preferable system, uh, particularly in any election where you're only electing one candidate for a single office or a single seat, which again is the vast majority of American elections. So yes, it works in primaries, in general elections, can work in local elections, um, could work as high up as presidential elections as well. So is it go um, gaining momentum now? I mean, what, how would you characterize the status of it nationally right now? Sure. So I definitely think it is gaining momentum, uh, especially in primary elections. We've seen a couple of very prominent examples, uh, most notably in the Democratic primary for the mayor of New York City in 2021 and the Republican convention for, uh, Re Republican convention for governor of Virginia. Uh, also in 2021. So Glenn Youngkin, Governor Glenn Youngkin, has ranked choice voting uh, to thank for, I think, his election uh, in 2021 in large part. Um, and we've also seen it adopted for general elections in a couple states, most notably Maine uh, and uh, this just this year, Alaska. Alaska. So very prominently, they had a special congressional election uh, elected using ranked choice voting just a couple months ago. Well, so let's, let's get some mechanics. So I have a preference. Um, do you have to vote for more than just your, quote, first choice? So um, as ranked choice voting has been used in any American election, you do not have to rank beyond your first choice. You can rank as many candidates as you wish, um, and your vote will still be counted. Now, of course, if you don't rank a second choice and your first choice uh, is eliminated, then your vote will not factor into the next round of voting. So it probably advantages voters to rank as many candidates as they, as they you know, have knowledge to vote. Um, but certainly you do not have to rank more than one candidate. 
It's interesting because I thought when I read that Australia, you have to, you must rank vote or your ballot won't even count. Yes, Australia has, Australia <laughs> is kind of an international leader in ranked choice voting. Um, they have used some form of it for, I believe, over 100 years. Um, really? And they have, but they have a lot of unusual uh, facets to their voting. So they do actually have compulsory voting in Australia. Uh, citizens have to vote by law, um, and they do have to rank all the candidates. Nevertheless, I have not heard a proposal for ranked choice voting in the United States that requires voters to rank all of the candidates. Wow, I say I had no idea. I, I, that's, that's fascinating, interesting. Well, so let's just go straight to what you perceive as some of the advantages of ranked choice. Um, and what I hear most is, look, we will no longer be stuck with the extremes, whether it's to the left or to the right? Certainly, I think it's true that ranked choice voting requires candidates to have a broad appeal in order to be elected, because ultimately, at some stage of the election, they have to win at least 50% of the vote. So you cannot sneak into office by winning 20% of the vote in a 10-candidate field. Um, now, this could be an extreme candidate who wins this 20%. Um, it could be a moderate candidate who wins that 20%. Um, but typically, you'll have to have more of a broad appeal. If that means being a moderate candidate, uh, that might frequently be true, um, but candidates could establish a broad appeal through a number of means. But yes, you do have to have a sort of, con you're electing a more consensus candidate through ranked choice voting. And does this point in time, is there any rationale, theory, or argument that it would benefit one party over another at this point in time? So. Certainly, I think in primary elections, there's not a lot of evidence that it's going to benefit that implementing ranked choice voting in the Democratic and or Republican primary would advantage one party over another. Um, in terms of would it advantage one party or another if it's used in a general election, that's really going to depend on the strength of minor parties and independent candidates. It's not designed, certainly, to systematically benefit one party or another. Um, the advantage of ranked choice voting, one of the other major advantages of ranked choice voting, is that someone who prefers a minor party candidate or an independent candidate can confidently vote for that candidate without worrying that they are wasting their vote because they can rank a major party candidate in second place or in third place, and if their minor party candidate, their minor party preference is eliminated, their vote will be reallocated. So there might be situations where, um, so for example, the famously the 2000 election, people say that Ralph Nader, the Green Party candidate, spoiled the election and led to the election of George W. Bush over Al Gore. And if Ralph Nader's voters had just voted for Al Gore instead, Al Gore would have been elected. Under ranked choice voting, the Ralph Nader voters could have ranked Al Gore second. Ralph Nader would have been eliminated and their votes would have been reallocated, perhaps leading to Al Gore winning that election. But of course, if you have, say, a libertarian candidate who's winning three or four percent of the vote, an independent right-leaning candidate who's winning some percentage of the vote, um, the fact that voters who might be on the right could vote for that candidate confidently and then have their votes reallocated towards the Republican could advantage the Republican. So it really depends on exactly who is running and the various strengths of the minor parties and independents in particular. Um, does this help minority candidates? If so, how? So I do think that ranked choice voting allows unconventional or previously underrepresented groups to engage in the political process more easily, right? Because uh, it allows candidates to run without fear that they are going to spoil the election among establishment candidates. Um, and it also allows for, I, I would say, in many cases, more coalition or positive campaigning um, because you don't necessarily want to alienate the voters for other candidates because you want those voters to rank you second or rank you third. Um, so I don't think we have a lot of evidence for how ranked choice voting might affect uh, minority candidates or previously underrepresented groups. Nevertheless, we've definitely seen anecdotal evidence where ranked choice voting has worked to the advantage of such groups. So uh, the newly elected congresswoman in Alaska is uh, an indigenous Alaskan uh, for the first time, you have uh, an indigenous Alaskan woman being elected to Congress. And ranked choice voting, I believe, facilitated that, at least to some extent. And of course, in New York City, you had an African-American mayor elected for the first time, I believe, in 30 years. 
Um, and, you know, did ranked choice voting directly lead to that? No, but it certainly did not disadvantage uh, racial minority groups in those cases. I even read where some suggest that, and, and you've hinted at it twice, that if you want to try to, to at least, quote, get the second, if I can't be your first choice, I, I want to be your second choice, we might not have such attack and attack and negative campaigns. It might actually improve campaigns. Is there any uh, truth to that from your perspective? I do think there is some evidence of that, at least anecdotally. Um, we saw some coalitions forming in the New York City Democratic primary uh, for mayor, where you had candidates saying, well, you should rank me first, but if you don't rank me first, I also like this candidate. You should rank that candidate first and rank me second. Or if you're voting for me, you should vote for this other candidate second. Um, and you probably don't want to really strongly negatively campaign against other strong candidates because you are hoping to win their second or third preferences. Um, we definitely see this informal campaign in Alaska going on right now called Rank the Red, which is encouraging voters whether they support one Republican or another to make sure that they rank first and second both Republican candidates. Um, you know, maybe to avoid the situation that happened in the uh, most recent Alaska election where a lot of people who voted for the Republican third place candidate, Nick Bagich, ended up ranking no one second place or actually ended up ranking the Democrat in second place um, and helped the Democrat win that election. Well, reflecting upon this, so... Um, and let's go to some uh, uh, challenges a little bit and that people would say about it. Um, so if it eliminates perhaps some of the extremes, uh, more consensus. But I think of times when like the Tea Party on the Republican side really did fundamentally change. In other words, it takes sometimes those fringes to bring about, and we know that some of the quote, progressives are trying to push not only candidates but also with Biden and last time and what have you but if you don't have what you would and I don't mean ri ridiculous extremes but you get my point that it might we end up with milk toast as candidates all the time right so one thing I would note about ranked choice voting is though even though it might aid consensus candidates in winning elections it also aids um, unconventional or maybe fringe candidates in getting engaged, at least in the political debate, getting their ideas put forward in the political debate, and perhaps causing people to think about elections in new ways, because it allows those candidates to run without the accusation that they are spoiling the election, and it allows their voters to campaign for those candidates and engage in those issues without, again, worrying about their wasting their votes or their spoiling the election. So, on one hand, I think it might lead to the election of more consensus candidates, but it also might lead to a greater, uh, a greater range of public debate and allowing new issues and new perspectives uh, to get into the public debate in these campaigns. Well, you know, what's interesting to me, so, so, and this is just the way my mind works, and of course I know there's a generational problem, but, so if I vote for, there are three candidates, A, B, and C, and I vote for A. Well, if A, it becomes a choice between A and C in a runoff, then I know what. If it's a choice between only B and C, I don't know that I would know that until I see what the alternatives are. Does that make sense at all? Um, what I'm trying to get at, in other words, I almost need to see this head to head because if I just go and said, okay, A, C, and B, and then D, but what if it comes down to C and D? Oh my goodness, well, that changes the whole perspective in my mind in terms of which way I might go. Does that make any sense? Sure, it does. If a voter wants to fully rank all the candidates, perhaps it demands them to become more fully informed. Nevertheless, the one thing I would say about that is under plurality rule, under a plurality rule election, right? if you prefer A, right, in a three candidate field, A, B, and C, you prefer A, you vote for A, A ends up in third, right? Well, under plurality rule election, you have no input into whether B or C gets elected, mm -hmm. right? You have no influence. You're, you are wasting your vote by voting for A. So at least under ranked choice voting, you have an opportunity to become informed and choose your second place vote and have an influence on the election between B and C. So in that sense, I don't think ranked choice voting is in any way a disadvantage to our, uh, compared to our existing system. I read someone that, uh, from someone who said, you know, this might actually do away with parties. In other words, parties would have less of a role. 
under such voting. Right. So I think that's, it really depends on what form of ranked choice voting is adopted. Um, so if you think about the Alaska system, Alaska implemented a fairly large reform to their entire election system, which both simultaneously adopted ranked choice voting, but also adopted something that we might call a jungle primary, in which all candidates of all parties run in the primary together, yeah. and the top four are advanced to the general election. And then those top four, regardless of party, run in that general election, a ranked choice voting election. That is one possibility. Nevertheless, ranked choice voting could still be adopted by parties in primaries or at the general election, um, which would not reduce the role of parties. So as ranked choice voting is currently used in Maine, it does not reduce the, use, uh, reduce the power of parties because parties still have separate primary elections and then the nominee of each party, regardless of who that is, still advances to the general election. So there is only one nominee of each party advancing to the general election. So parties still have the same role that they would in our current election process. The one difference perhaps being that minor parties like a Green Party or a Libertarian Party, again, uh, they don't purely act as spoilers. Um, they, you know, people, their supporters can vote for their preference, again, without worrying about throwing their vote away. You know, one thing that's interesting about Alaska, you bring it up, 60% of voters voted Republican, but a Democrat won. Um, that seems a little um, um, uh, counterintuitive, doesn't so, it? So 60% of voters in the first round voted for a Republican candidate, but what we need to keep in mind is that a lot of those Republican voters did not prefer the leading Republican candidate, who was Sarah Palin. A lot of those Republican candidates, a lot of those Republican voters were perhaps more moderates, maybe they were independents. They preferred the more moderate Republican option, Nick Begich. But then, if they couldn't get Nick Begich, they didn't want Sarah Palin. Right? So instead of voting for Sarah Palin second, they voted for the Democrat second. And that Democrat did get the majority of vote when matched up head to head against Sarah Palin. Under our normal system, our existing system that's used in most elections, probably you would have had a Republican primary between Nick Begich and Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin probably would have won that primary, and she would have gone head to head against Mary Peltola, the Democrat, um, and you know, Mary Peltola would have had a good chance in that election anyway. So I don't think that ranked choice voting led to the Democrat defeating the Republican in any straightforward way. It led to a more consensus Democrat defeating a very controversial and some might say extreme Republican um, in, in a way that I think reflected the will of the majority of the voters. You know, the other interesting factoid from, from Alaska, 85% indicated that they ranked candidates and 66% ranked more than two. So that was kind of a strong showing as an experiment there in terms of the willingness or acceptance of ranked choice. Right, I think the 85% is the really important number there in that you had three competitive candidates. In a field of three competitive candidates, you really don't need to rank more than two candidates. Um, and it, it, we, you definitely saw surveys suggesting that almost everyone in Alaska understood the system and thought it was easy to use. Um, and I think the majority of voters were satisfied with the outcome. So some people say, look, let's just look at the process of ranked choice voting. You're not going to go to bed necessarily knowing who won. Um, so it takes longer to determine a winner. It doesn't necessarily take longer to determine a winner. So if an election is very, very close, regardless of the system that you use, it's gonna take a while to determine the winner, especially now that we have more, uh, more mail-in voting, more ways to cast provisional ballots, things like that. Um, I would say that the system of vote counting that's been used in Maine and Alaska is perhaps not ideal, um, in that they wait until all of the votes have been uh, received and counted before they run the ranked choice voting tabulation. So you do not have any idea what the second round or third round of the election is going to look like until a week or two after the election. However, that's not necessarily the way that ranked choice voting has to be run or has to be communicated to the voters. So other localities have chosen to communicate all of the second and third choice preferences immediately as they are being counted. So at least you have an idea for what the election is going to look like in the final round. And if the election is not you know, really, really close, you are going to know the winner fairly quickly. So you know, in the systems that we have now and given the environment about voter in voting integrity, which seems to be two different views, can mean two different things to different people, but without getting all of that. 
But man, you're talking about a conspiracy theory. It's like, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I voted. Now, they're saying there's a second and there's a third. There's a time frame here. I, would that further perhaps erode confidence in the results? I mean, it's just a, a process thing, but you've got to make sure the second choice is the second choice and the third is really the third choice and that kind of thing. Sure. I think um, <laughs> as we move toward any sort of ballot reform, we need to be very transparent um, in how votes are being counted and transparent in how the system is working. And also, you know, count the votes as quickly as we can do uh, while still fully preserving the integrity of the election. So I would like to see, as states and localities adopt ranked choice voting, uh, these states also fully communicating second and third choice preferences as soon as they are able to, uh, to make the election as transparent as possible. I think some localities have done this well and some localities have not done this as well. Um, but certainly this is not an inherent aspect of ranked choice voting. It is just an aspect of how the, how the votes are counted in a particular locality. Well, I also never thought of this, but it was an interesting uh, legal kind of question. Does it violate the notion of one person, one vote? So I would definitely say it does not violate the, the, the notion of one person, one vote. Um, I, I mean, you could say that the concept of primary elections violates the concept of one person, one vote. You're casting one vote in a primary and then one vote in a general election. You're casting two votes. Or in the case of runoff elections, like we saw in Georgia Senate elections uh, a year and a half ago, you know, you cast a vote in the primary, you cast a vote maybe in the primary runoff, you cast a vote in the general, you cast a vote in the general election. You're casting four different votes. Well, ranked choice voting is exactly the same thing, except those elections are happening simultaneously in some sense. So in each round, your vote is being counted once and your vote is being counted equally to every other person's vote. So in each round of the election, you are, you, one person, one vote definitely applies. You know, this is kind of inside the beltway because of, of our interest in politics and campaigns. But if I was a pollster, what am I going to, how, what, and how do you now calculate in terms of ranked choice voting and your polling kind of analyses, and even in terms of campaigns kind of managing it, mm -hmm. it's going to be an interesting challenge there. Right, and certainly I've seen pollsters ask about people's second choice and third choice. Uh. I've, seen, I've seen very recently polls of Alaska where they're Alaska asking people what is your second choice if you know, your preferred candidate is eliminated. Um, and so pollsters have to communicate that data as well. Very interesting. Well, let's turn. We have about three minutes or so remaining. Um, but let's focus on Virginia. Um, Legally, it's on the books for local elections, but not necessarily for statewide or what have you. Help us, what, what, where are we in Virginia? Sure, so the Virginia legislature recently passed a bill that allows localities to adopt ranked choice voting for city councils and local elections if they choose. Um, and we are hoping, and part of what Upvote Virginia is doing, is trying to encourage localities to adopt ranked choice voting for their local elections. Uh, parties, if they choose to hold conventions, like the Virginia Republican Party did for governor in 2021, they can use ranked choice voting if they choose. Um, in terms of state elections, like for state legislature or federal elections, I believe that would require a, con a state constitutional amendment to be adopted. Um, I, I would like to see that happen, but I think that's sort of farther in the future, at least in Virginia. Well, I know that um, I think the Virginia League of Women Voters support it, Governor Allen, uh, has come out and, and, and supported it. Um, and so what in the remaining couple of minutes we have, what's your prediction? Where it goes next? Where do you see next in the initiative? What about the future of ranked choice voting? So I definitely think that ranked choice voting uh, will be adopted, especially for primaries in a lot more, in a lot more locations. Um, I do hope to see it adopted in localities in Virginia. Um, I think we've seen it work very well in primaries in several high profile instances. Um, and I think we're going to see ranked choice voting at least appear as, for instance, a ballot referendum in more and more states. Um, so far, in terms of adoption at the general election level, we've seen it adopted in states where third parties are more influential. So Maine has a history of uh, electing independent candidates. Alaska has a history of electing independent or third party candidates. Um, and so I think ranked choice voting was seen as more, more imperative in those states. Um, in a state like Virginia, where perhaps minor parties are not as pivotal frequently in elections, um, I think there's maybe less of a immediate incentive to try to adopt at the general election level, but I think we are seeing movement in several states in that direction. Wow. 
Well, that is all the time that we have. Um, very informative. You, you, you might have moved me. You might have That's great made to hear. me come over there now. I, I, I'm intrigued, especially in answering a couple of those questions. So I just certainly want to thank you for being a guest. And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.